turning to my favorite visa type, not so much that it's the visa type that we charge the most for, but because it's the one that really gets to the heart of this town as far as I'm concerned, which is, you know, entrepreneur, entrepreneurism. Um, foreign nationals come to Hong Kong in droves. They get off the airport, they get off the aircraft and they can smell the air and they smell money and they say, right, I want a piece of this. And so normally, as we see, they, um, uh, they use the visitor visa for a certain amount of time to get the lay of the land. And then they say, right, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to establish a business. So what do I do about immigration status? Um, this represents about 80% of our workload. And uh, it's the one that I'm talking about almost constantly, day in, day out. OK, so to apply for a business investment visa, you need to be a foreign national, not a, not a mainlander, but a foreign national. Um, and you need to show that you can make a substantial contribution to the economy of Hong Kong. Which, of course, is in many ways, it's like asking how long is a piece of string. But there are um, certain themes that run writ large throughout an approved investment visa application. And these themes are the creation of local employment opportunities. These are the availability of business premises that are suitable for the constructs of your plan. And that you have resources, both financial resources and non-funding resources, which I'll, I'll come to. Um, but the way the Immigration Department look at it is if you can pass this approvability test, then clearly you, um, you're going to um, um, uh, be welcome in Hong Kong because of the three, three uh, pillars of approval that I've just uh, uh, outlined to you. Um, the thing to note right from the get-go, though, before I get into the heart of the approvability test, is the conundrum that exists for anyone who's making an application for a business investment visa. And effectively, it's a catch-22 that exists. And it goes like this. You have to show that you can make, prospectively, a contribution to the economy of Hong Kong. Now, the law says that you can't join in a business until you secure the consent of the Immigration Department. But you can't secure the consent of the Immigration Department until you show a contribution to Hong Kong. And, in fact, as you'll see, you can't show contribution to Hong Kong without actually joining in a business. Because what the Immigration Department are looking for when considering the approvability test is you having created, in a sense, new facts on the ground here in Hong Kong so that they can be persuaded that of your potential to make that substantial contribution. But you can't create those new facts on the ground as a visitor because you'd be breaching your conditions of stay. So how do you get around it? And it's like everything with Hong Kong immigration, pure pragmatism. They close their eyes. They effectively, if you have an active application in the system, they forbear to prosecute for any, as they would have it, perceived breach of conditions of stay as a visitor. And I guess there's probably legal ramifications because you might, uh, you might conclude that the way that policy is being implemented you're actively encouraging people to breach their conditions of stay because you're asking them to adduce evidence that they've created these new facts on the ground. And you could then scratch your head and say, well, I suppose they're endorsing it's OK for me to do this. So, so the way it works is if you have an active application in the system, the Immigration Department don't care. If you don't have an active application in the system, then the Immigration Department do care. So if the Immigration Department find out that you're undertaking a, a business as a visitor, they have something to say about that. Particularly if you presented yourself at the boundary or at the, at the airport as a visitor and you don't know how the world works and you say to the immigration officer when he asks you what you're doing here and he says, well, I'm running a business, then the immigration officer will have something to say about that. So effectively, the way that you solve the problem is by getting an, ap active, getting an active application in the system straight away. And I always tell the client, if your intention to reside is crystallized, then at that point, submit an application for business investment visa. 
Unfortunately, many foreign nationals decide that they would prefer to wait as long as they possibly can for any number of reasons uh, before they submit their application, which can be a good thing, but it can be a bad thing. It can be a good thing because you actually create the circumstances that the Immigration Department would like to see to anticipate an approval, but it can be a bad thing because if you set off on your entrepreneurial journey and you have, with all good intentions, that the expectation that you're going to be in a position three or four months down the road to actually deliver on uh, an approvable scenario for the Immigration Department, and business being what business is, you don't actually achieve those outcomes. And before you know it, you've been running a business, hanging on by the skin of your teeth for the last 18 months, with everything invested, and you haven't got anything going on whatsoever that the Immigration Department will actually conclude represents your p a potential to make a substantial contribution to the economy of Hong Kong. And now what you've got is this bear of a business, and you've got this profile as a visitor shuttling backwards and forwards, and you've got you know, the, the omnipresent... Um, uh, danger of the immigration department saying the next time you, they present you, well, what's going on here? And then giving you a short conditional landing. So, so you know, some foreign nationals get themselves into quite a pickle by not um, realizing what's required to get an investment visa approved, and they go off and start the business anyway. So it's a double-edged sword. But, uh, but this is how, um, when clients usually say to you, well, uh, how can, I, how can I create all this stuff on the ground if I'm here as a visitor? I, I can't create these jobs. I'm not allowed to do that. I, I, I can't, I can't um, engage in these contracts or, or do all the things that I'm kind of expected to do because I'm not allowed to do it. So I'm not going to be able to sub submit that to the Immigration Department. And I always say, well, no, that's just a cop-out. Actually, the Immigration Department will close their eyes to what you're doing as long as you're able to pass the approvability test. And I still think it comes as a surprise to everybody that goes on to get approved that they've been able to engage in all this activity as a visitor and the Immigration Department hasn't taken them to task for it. But, but that's how it works. <clears throat> so, um, because of Hong Kong's entrepreneurial orientation, I always tell, say to clients, look, if you're committed to the business, to the same extent as you're committed to your employment visa, to your investment visa application, you're going to get approved. Because you do what you have to do in business to be successful, right? It's the same for immigration as well. And particularly these days when you've got a psychology of startups and lean ways of operating and minimal viable products and basically getting into a business with the bare minimum of financial commitment and bare minimum of, of more substantive commitment, hoping that you're going to be successful when you get sort of, you know, towards the end of the early part of your endeavor. All that's well and good from a commercial perspective, but if you expect the immigration department to buy into that, representing substantiality, at the moment, the way that they administer policy, it's not going to work. So, passing the approvability test, as I've mentioned, has got three pillars of approval. The first is you have to have suitable business premises. It's got to be suitable in all the circumstances. Co-working spaces, shared offices are okay. You can start off with a virtual office as long as you've got a clear pathway to proper business premises. Normally when you've hired your first employee and your plan would show that. You can't expect the immigration department to approve your investment visa application if you're planning to run this business from your spare bedroom or your kitchen table. Not going to happen. Local recruitment, creation of local jobs. As I say here, the quality of the jobs is just as important to the number job the, as the number of the jobs, and future jobs will work. You don't have to have created jobs now or at the point of approval. You can say to the immigration department when you put forward a really good, sensible plan that you are going to create jobs, and it's going the timeline through the creation of those jobs is, is X amount, and at the time that you create those jobs, then you'll upgrade your office premises, because as I say, you can't, the employees can't report to work to your kitchen table every day. And as long as, as long as you set it out that there's a clear pathway to local employment opportunities, and it's rational in all the circumstances, in my experience, the immigration department <laughs> will buy into that. They will, in the main, if they're satisfied, if they're not satisfied as to the sustainability of, of, the, of what you're intending to do at the point of approval, they may say, well, all right, we'll give you the first 12 months, that's no problem. 
but we're going to subject your next extension to a review of your business. So we want to look back at what's gone on over the last 12 months to ensure that you have, in fact, been taking steps to make the substantial contribution to the economy of Hong Kong. And then we'll assess really where you are at that time. Um, the other thing to, to, to say about the business review exercise is that um, once you get the, original, the initial approval and the review at the end of 12 months, in my experience, as long as you've earnestly tried to move the business forward in all of those 12 months, and you haven't just then sort of taken your approval and then sat around or spent the last year painting pictures of the harbour and not doing anything with your business, then because the immigration department don't want to pull the rug from under the feet of entrepreneurs, they will extend you after a vigorous review, but they'll subject you to review the next year as well. Now, the cynical amongst us could say, well, that sounds like an half decent plan, right? If I can get my first approval and sort of utter my way through to, to the first year and then, you know, make a decent argument and explain, you know, how it hasn't really panned out because after all, no business plan survives first contact with the enemy. Um, perhaps when um, I get my business reviewed, I'll be able to get another 12 months and then just keep on going like that. Um, and it's not a strategy I'd espouse, but you'd be absolutely amazed the number of people that come to me after seven years and effectively they're coming to me for the right of abode application and I've looked at what they've been doing and they literally have been going from year to year to year to year extending on a one-year basis not subject to the one two two three year pattern but just year after year after year going through a six or an eight week review exercise producing accounts and you know producing documentation that speaks to how they've been looking for the right candidate for the job but they can't find anybody and Anyway, it, it, it would appear that the immigration department don't actually take the status away from you as long as you're earnestly moving the business forward. But, uh, but, but I certainly wouldn't advise anybody to be, uh, to be adopting that strategy if you can eat through uh, the first year because uh, life's too short for, uh, for dealing with the immigration department every year for six or eight weeks at a time. Okay, so suitable business premises, local recruitment, and then resources. I'd say... This is where the rubber hits the road in, in terms of um, what the immigration departments are, are looking to see beyond the um, creation of local jobs and the employment opportunities. So these are financial resources. How are you going to fund the business and where is the money coming from? Technically, the immigration departments say that any funds that you use to finance your business, you need to have owned beneficially for at least two years immediately prior to submitting the application. In practice, what they do is they call for three months bank statements. And what we do is, because it's a four to a six month process if you're applying for this visa on an entry visa basis, we submit a snapshot of where they are financially at the point of approval, and then we submit three months bank statements just by, sorry, let me back up. We submit a snapshot of where they are financially at the point of application submission, and then we submit three months bank statements, usually about month four, month five, so the immigration department can see that the money's been available throughout all of that time and they're clear they've got the money that they need to finance the business accordingly. Um, the second type of resources are commercial resources. So, as I say, effectively, you know, who you're doing business with and um, what support do you have. Now, commercial resources are really all those kinds of things that you have at play in your business that are driving you to make this <coughs> make this investment decision in the first place. So it's all well and good having money and it's all well and good having a really good idea but, but most rational entrepreneurs actually have a little bit more uh, of substance going on that are, that are driving them to actually move this uh, opportunity forward that's leading them to make the investment visa application. Um, so in this regard it can be you know have, what contracts have you got any work in progress have you got confirmed clients are you bringing IP to Hong Kong that's been successful somewhere else and if you deployed in Hong Kong it's going to be successful for you here have you got a have you got if it's a technology company have you got a, a minimum minimum viable products have you cut uh, have you spent you know some time previously developing code to the point where it, it's now about to be finished all of these things as I say the kind of things that you would expect to have present um, that, that, that they're giving you the confidence to make this, uh, this, this decision to invest in this business in the first place. Are they all present? And as part of the application, you show to the Immigration Department as much of this stuff as you possibly can so that they can conclude that, that actually there's a really good chance that when you take your money and, 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 um, uh, and the, uh, the opportunities um, 
that are in, uh, are uh, included in the um, in the documentation that they can see as reflecting commercial resources. That your business stands a really good chance of going on to become a solidly entrenched commercial enterprise. Okay, so there's those two resources. The third resource is track record. You know, what's your CV look like? Have you have you done this before previously? Interestingly, when you apply for an employment visa, the, your CV is absolutely pivotal. Special skills, knowledge and experience of value to are not really available in Hong Kong. But in the context of business investment visa, your CV is a mere resource. And you don't need to be a graduate. And you don't need 10 years of prior experience if, in fact, um, you're going to make an investment visa application. And then, because you know it is the Immigration Department after all, part of the Security Bureau, uh, Security Branch, uh, or is the business in compliance? So, um, is it licensed, properly registered, business registration? Um, what's going on? Anything that suggests that uh, there should be uh, the approval of another another agency for the purposes of being able to carry out this business lawfully? Is all that in place? If it's in place, you're, you're home free. Is there any security objection to the nature of what you're proposing to do? Now, let, give, let me give you an example of a security objection that played itself out in a very interesting way for me. It would have been just after the handover. There was a company that were primarily out of the Philippines, but they were, they were owned by, if I remember properly, a, 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 an American guy, an Indian guy, and somebody from Singapore. And what they'd done is they put together a multi-level marketing business. And it was primarily, the audience for this multi-level marketing business was primarily the Filipino domestic helper community here because they'd taken the same offering to the Philippines and cleaned up. And effectively, what the product was, was um, the, the, the foundation product was, was an investment in a gold coin, a Krugerrand, if I remember properly. And en route to actually owning these Krugerrands was this, this chain of introductions that allowed everybody that was in the chain of introductions to, to make a margin in a typical multi-level marketing type scenario. But it wasn't, it wasn't a Ponzi scheme because in the final analysis, the value that was there was reflected in the Krugerrand. Um, and, and I listened to their business model and I said to myself, Okay, how are the immigration department going to make of this? And then I asked them, I said, like, you know, what's its lawful status in the Philippines? Said, oh, it's perfectly lawful. Da, da 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 da. I said, okay, fine. So, what have we got that shows that this is lawful in Hong Kong? I've got QC opinion. Okay, let me have a look at it. Okay, that's fine. So, we submitted the application to the immigration department, and lo and behold, they obviously had some problem with it. And what the immigration department do if they have a problem with something? but don't have the means to resolve it, is they do nothing. So the applications went in, and they were growing this business, and after about 12 months, the immigration department still hadn't made a decision. And then, of course, the client started to get antsy about this because they're here doing what they're doing in business, and then the catch-22 is, is sort of running through their uh, their psychology, knowing that the immigration department could at any time if they wanted to come in and have something to say about it, but they never did. Um, and if, they, if, if eventually they decided that if they couldn't actually get immigration status to be here with their families and all the rest of it, they would just go somewhere else and they'd exploit some other market, which is what I understood that they actually did. But, but there is a, a really good example where there was a security, clearly a security objection, but the immigration department couldn't put the finger on it quite properly, and they're certainly not going to take a view as to whether or not it's a Ponzi scheme, because they're going to end up you know, in all kinds of uh, hot water if they take that view. So, so simply what they did was just to do nothing, so the problem didn't exist. And, and normally, as, as we see with immigration, the longer it takes for an approval and the, more, the longer you're here as a visitor, the more nervous and antsy you get about it all, and so eventually the problem goes away. So it's very, very pragmatic. Substantial contribution to the economy of Hong Kong. We have uh, three legs of the approvability stool, and we've got typically four sets of resources. Normally, the way it works from an approvals perspective is that you know, the client comes to you, and they've incorporated a company, and they're thinking about what they need to do commercially to be successful, 
and they're you know turning their attention to really what's required for the for the visa. And you take them through three legs of the approvability stool and you advise them accordingly, and then they adjust their they adjust their expectations of what they're supposed to do to be successful, and then and then they will go off and then normally they implement uh, their business plan in accordance with the things that you've advised them to do. And 99 times out of 100, you can expect to get approval. And this is for the people that actually take advice on this matter. Uh, you'd be amazed at the number of um, people who don't take any advice, in fact, don't even spend any time on our websites. But they go to the immigration department and they, they get the forms and they think it's really easy and so they submit the basic information and then it goes in and then it gets refused. Um, so there's still this kind of like um, prevailing idea that somehow getting an investment visa is really easy and it doesn't require too much work or, or endeavor to, uh, to be successful with it. And so clients will come in to you sometimes, especially if they've, um, uh, if they've been refused or they're, they're thinking it's actually time for them to get some advice. And, and they'll say to you, okay, well, look, you know, my, my, I should get a visa because uh, I'm going to be successful and I'm going to be paying tax. Well, there's two problems there, isn't there, right? I mean, there's no guarantee of success, and you pay tax, so what? You know, who doesn't pay tax? Um, another old chestnut is, oh, I've heard that you need two million Hong Kong dollars as a minimum, or I need a million dollars from them. It's not true. I've had applications approved with 350,000 Hong Kong dollars in the bank account. You know, you've got to make your life e as easy as you possibly can, and in many ways, that's setting the expectations of the client as to you know what kind of level of commitment they should be making to the business. But I always deal with this and say, no, there's no such thing as as a, as a particular minimum. Um, but what you've got to do is you've got to understand that the money that you bring to Hong Kong, you can put it into your company by way of loan capital. You don't have to capitalize it by issuing equity to that value. Put it in as a loan capital. And whatever money you're bringing to Hong Kong, that can be sufficient for the purposes of, of your immediate, immediate operational needs. Because the immigration department are going to ask for copies of your bank statements wherever you have banks, uh, sorry, bank accounts anywhere in the world. Because the immigration department look at your ability to fund your business in the round. So I always say to the client, say, look, what you need to do is, if you've got, let's say, a million dollars Hong Kong, great. Calculate what six months operational expenses are and put them into the Hong Kong company bank account. So that's going to get you off the mark. And then the immigration department can see you've got resources elsewhere that you stand by ready to commit to the business if and when uh, you need them. So there's no such thing as a Hong Kong, sorry, as a, as, a, as a minimum amount that's needed. There's certainly a threshold where if you haven't got enough money, the immigration department are going to say, no, you have to have the ability to finance it. But I'll caveat that again with an example that I faced a few years ago where actually it was a business investment visa application because it was the only type that we could apply for for this lady and she was a barrister admitted in the UK and she was an arbitrator and she would come to Hong Kong and uh, um, talk to whoever she needed to talk to and then she would go to Macau and she'd do the work that she needed to do and then she would, she would um, she'd come back when she would got, got all that out of the way. Now actually she didn't need uh, a specific business investment visa for what she wanted to do. Her real problem was that her son, who had uh, struggled academically in her home country, had, um, had been admitted into school in Hong Kong for about six months as a visitor. And, and as you'll see when we talk about dependent visas, principals in, in Hong Kong are quite flexible to having kids be admitted or enrolled in school while they're here as visitors, as long as they've got clear evidence that an application for residence visas have been submitted to the immigration department. So she had been able to finagle six months of, uh, of education for this kid. And that, uh, the key thing for her was to actually have another six months so that she could, uh, so the kid could finish her education and they could move on. So I said, look, you know, when I look at the way that you do your business, okay, you are not going to ever have business premises. You're never going to employ anybody locally. And you've got no need whatsoever to expend any capital. So it doesn't matter how much capital you've got. So how am I supposed to get you a business investment visa under the normal criteria? I said, but I'll tell you what we'll do. If the real trick is to keep your son in school for the next six months, then what we'll do is we'll submit an application for the investment visa, and then we'll play every trick in the book to spin it out as long as we possibly can to the point where we expect the immigration department to say no, and then the kid, of course your son will be educated and you can go on. She thought it was a great idea because he's a lawyer, right? Three weeks later, she gets approved. 
so there you have a situation where none of the approvability uh, criteria are actually in play, but the immigration department said yes to it. So go figure. Okay, another old chestnut is oh, my favorite one. Ah, but my friend, no two immigration cases are ever the same, and you can't learn anything at all from an application that somebody else has experienced and, and, and expect that you're going to have the same encounter in the context of your own application. And, it, and it, it frustrates me no end when I hear this because it clearly is, um, it doesn't add any value to uh, expectation management of the part of the, the clients. All right, so um, how do you improve your chances? Sorry, I had a question. Yeah. For the investment visa, do you have had to hire somebody before you submit? No. The application, no. Or it's just the intention to. It, it, that's correct. Yeah. So you have, you have a half decent plan. Bear in mind, you don't need a sixty-page business plan because the immigration department no more wants to read a sixty-page business plan than, than the client might want to write one. If they've got one, great. But if you you know if you're advising them to put together a detailed business plan, there's no need for that. What we do is we say send us in advance of about maybe two or three pages of bullet points of what's going to happen for you progressively over the course of the first three years and then put together a three-year set of financials that lays out what's going to happen. And so with the information that they give you on the bullet points and the, and the projections that you've got, you write your argument from the bullet points and you illustrate it with the, with the, with the projections. And then obviously the projections will, will show to you when you're going to hire. So if you've got a clear pathway to the recruitment within, those plan, within that plan, that's usually sufficient. So no, absolutely no need to have employees in place at the time of approval. But I'll caveat that by saying, if you have genuinely an opportunity to have people working for you at that time, and perhaps you might not have great, a great amount of resources, then having the employee, in my experience, sort of, you know, um, it, uh, it bolsters your chance of, appro of approval if you don't have significant resources to back you up. Because the immig immigration department can see there that you're trying. Okay, so uh, how do you improve your chances of success? Um, if you're a current visitor, I always say to clients, think big, behave big, take advice, get a sponsor who's a name, if that's at all possible to you. Get a sponsor who's got some obvious nexus to you, who's got some value that they can add in the, uh, to, to your situation. Sponsorship itself is really just the mechanism that the immigration department use to be able to claim the cost of re uh, of removal in the event that the residence goes awry for any reason. Um, but if you can show that you've got a big name or somebody other sponsor, some other party that's, that's there sponsoring you, you can factor them into the story. You can make it look you know, like it's probably bigger and more profound, than, than the relationship is bigger and more profound than you might otherwise you know, have it be in fact. But, but as a current visitor, I think that's the way that you, um, that's, that's the way you can really improve your chances of success. Because remember, the Immigration Department are always um, doing their work on the strength of the documentation that they have before them. And that gives you a great opportunity as lawyers to be able to, you know, as I say, tell a story, make the show pony look like a thoroughbred without telling any lies or misrepresenta misrepresenting the situation. So it's not necessary that the sponsor is the company that you are going to establish or non need to be a, a director or shareholder of the company that you are it, going to? It can be an officer of the company, it can be an employee of the company, but it can't be the company itself, and it can't be you as director. Normally what you do is you find... It cannot be the company itself. So. No. no. Normally what you do is you find uh, a permanent identity card holder that you've got a relationship with that's prepared to put their name forward and serve as your sponsor. And that's why if you've got another party who can... Um, it can't be your own company, but it can be another company that can serve as a sponsor, but your own company can't be your sponsor. So if you've got a trading partner who's prepared to to, to, to serve as your sponsor, by all means. And ideally, the bigger the better, because the bigger they are, the more the Immigration Department are going to be impressed. Questions now? All right. And then if you're a current employee, you're changing your status from sponsored employment through to business investment, how can you improve your chances of success? I always say, if your application is otherwise marginal, wait till you've been here for about three years. Because whilst the Immigration Department will, will always apply the approvability test to your application, they figure that after about three years, as long as you've got a modicum of resources available to you to be successful in the context of your plan, 
then you know you know how Hong Kong works. You've got some relationships. You, the likelihood of you being successful is probably improved because of the fact that you now know a little bit about Hong, how Hong Kong operates. So, so certainly I advise clients all the time if they're marginal, look, just 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 wait until you've been here for three years, and then you know your um, perhaps your your two hundred and fifty thousand Hong Kong dollars might suffice rather than you know half a million, say for example, in that type of situation. And again, thinking big, behaving big, taking advice, or indeed joining in a side business. Now, joining in a side business is a really interesting way to um, anticipate an eventual approval for a business that's marginal today that eventually could go on to be uh, satisfactory for the purposes of a business investment visa approval. And the way it works is this, is that you are presently working for another employer and you have an employment visa and you want to join in the side business and because you're joining in a side business on a part-time basis the approvability test isn't held so strictly against you because the immigration department are just wanting to make sure that what you're planning to do is legal from the perspective that you've got their permission but they're not going to inquire as to the merits or otherwise of the business from a, an overall contribution to the economy of Hong Kong perspective. And, oops. and so why I think joining in a side business first is, is a good maneuver is because it sets the stage for a full business investment visa application later because you've kind of like, you've got the immigration department maybe a third of the way there by getting their permission to what it is that you're hoping to do and then subsequently when you want to stop working for an existing employer, you go back to the immigration department and say, hey, you know that side business that I started? Well, guess what? I now want to do it full time. Will you please let me do it full time? So, uh, as I say, the immigration department uh, are engaged right from the outset and they can see what you're all about. They can see what you were saying you know, a year or two ago and they can see today where you are and then they can then take some solace from what's happened in that intervening period to anticipate what's going to happen in the future. So it makes it easier for them to follow your progress, your commercial progress, whilst you've been engaged in this business on a, spot, on a side business basis only. Um, normally, a limited liability company uh, incorporated in Hong Kong is, is, is expected of, a, of an entrepreneur that's uh, going to get a business investment visa simply because the immigration department systems are set up to anticipate uh, dealing with uh, incorporated uh, companies and also because normally the immigration department don't ascribe a lot of sophistication to a sole proprietorship because it's easy to to establish right it's cheap and the like and most entrepreneurs that go sole proprietorship route are really thinking it's going to be a small business from the outset rather than a full business. Now, we could debate whether there's any merit, of, merit uh, or not in the immigration department's posture in that regard, but certainly the limited liability company, in my experience, is what the immigration department are looking for in an investment visa application. But when you're joining in a side business, it's okay to have a sole proprietorship because all they're interested in is making sure that your business is properly registered here. So it's okay uh, to have a sole prop if you're, in, uh, if you're going to join in the side business. There's no sponsorship issue here because effectively you're still sponsored by your existing employer. It's just that you're doing this thing on the side. But there is, oops, there is a condition precedent and this quite often kills it for most, um, uh, most people that are going to make an application to join the side business. And that is you've got to get the permission of your existing employer to join in this business. So if you can't get that, the application will fail. If you can get it, 99 times out of 100, the immigration department say, yes, not an issue. So okay. what, do you, what do you do to start your side business? Do you need to apply to the immigration department? Yep, yep. You, um, you, have your, you have your business registration certificate. You have three or four page explanation of what you're going to do. You show that you've got money in your, in your business bank account. And then you submit a letter of consent from, or a lender of no objection from your employer for you to join in the side business. And they look at that and then they will approve you normally by issuing you a letter saying, yeah, we approve you to join in the side business of and it's subject to you remaining employed by your current employer and all that kind of stuff. So I'm confused. Then, then you would have two visas, uh, one visa and a business visa at the same time? Or how does that work? No, you have an employment visa with special dispensation to join in the side business 
reflected in written authorization of the Director of Immigration. So, assuming you were just kind of continue on with your original employer, yeah. is, do you still need permission to set up a side business? Sorry, uh, Steve. I know, I'll give you an example. I've yeah. got several clients like this, uh, yeah. pilots, yeah. pilots who have a lot of spare time yeah. and have side businesses. Yeah. Are they meant to get uh, dispensation Absolutely. from uh, immigration departments? Absolutely. To those businesses? Absolutely. Because they're here, residents in Hong Kong, to do the work that they were approved to do and nothing more. So if they're joining in a side business, they need to get the permission of the immigration department to do that. And they'll get approved. But you need to make that well, application. I assume that they can get the airline, of course, to do it. Sorry, when you're talking about joining into a side business, I, I suppose it means that they have to actually be doing the work for it as opposed to owning it or investing in it. It's the same thing. Oh, even if they invest. <laughs> If you, if, you, if you invest but you're actively engaged in the management of the enterprise, you need to make an application right. to join in the side business. If you're going to passively invest, then no. Then no, right. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so that's side business. Any other questions on that? Can yet? I see kind of a clarification? Yeah. Um, because there's the employment regime where these guys are supposed to have these specialist skills and it doesn't quite matter whether they actually own it or their specialist skills come on top, right? So, like, which, which you know, class of applications would you put a person, you know, who's got the specialist skills but who also has investment? Like, you know, who are the people who are doing the investment scheme who's also got specialist skills? Or, or will you normally put those guys... Because if you're running a business and you're driving a business, right, you've got, you know, you, you won't be kind of a new grad and, you know, have a lot, lot of, um, you know, you'll have people who are five years, you know, or ten years into, you know, into some industry who says, oh, well, that's great, I'm going to do my own thing, but, you know, I want to be employed, but I, you, there's the specialist skills. The, do you know, do you know what I mean? I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Are you talking about... Somebody who was here with an employment visa. Yeah, employment visa. And they, and they got that that visa because they possess special skills, knowledge, and experience. That's right. And then and they, they want to join the side business, or they want to start a new business completely. Which which scenario are you anticipate? No, and then they move from that employment really to into a business that they business. Own. Right, yeah, okay. or or even business that they own. Like I mean. If, if it's right. majority interest or whatever, yeah, so they yeah. say, look, you know, I, I think I could do it better on my own. Yeah. You know, I've got this fantastic specialist skills. Yeah. Do you then put them under the investment or the employment? Investment. Okay. Investment. Because they will effectively have value at risk in their enterprise, so that makes them an investor. So you apply the investment visa provability test. And the fact that they've got specialist skills that's driving them to make this investment decision is a resource to the application. It's not definitive in of itself. The immigration department will look at it and they'll say, well, I can see that you've been a sushi chef all of your life and we gave you a visa to be a sushi chef and in all of that time you've saved a whole lot of money or you've been very successful in the stock market and now, we, we, now you want us to give you permission to leave that employer and start your own sushi restaurant. They'll say, okay, in that regard, you're welcome to, uh, to establish that business because you, know, you can make a substantial contribution to the economy of Hong Kong. And the fact that he's got sushi chef qualifications is, 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 is important probably pivotal in this example, but ultimately it's, it's only a resource to the application. It's not part of the substantial contribution that is going to be made test. That's dealt with side business. Now what about if you're here uh, working for another employer and you want to effectively leave that employer and then go and start your own business? What did the immigration department make of that? Okay, so basically the fact that you have an employment visa sponsored by an existing employer doesn't make it transferable to whatever you're expecting to do in your own business. You have to make an application to change your visa category. And again, the test is the same, substantial contribution to the economy of Hong Kong. Um, there you go. So you change your category to business investment. And um, as I say, until you've been here three years, in my experience, the provability test is just as onerous. Although, what I can tell you is that current practice at the moment is that the Immigration Department are being very generous to existing employees that are starting their own businesses. 
We're being very generous in so far as as long as you've got a basic amount of money to fund your plans and you've got a decent story, they're going to say yes to what you're all about. Um, and they will subject your next extension to business review. But what's interesting is if you can get a client that's in the one, two, two, three year pattern and he, he's in, he's been in six, five or six years and he's got his three year extension, you can get his approval on modest, modest, approvability, modest approval criteria and then the three years that he's got left will carry him across the seven year line and even though he's being subject to business review at the end of his current limit of stay, his next limit of stay, he'll never be called to account for that because at the time that he make an application for permanent residency, there's no inquiry as to what's been happening in the business during that intervening period. So I'm getting quite a lot of ex-investment ex bankers that have got lots of money and they've got a half-decent plan um, and uh, they've been here for you know, just over six years or so. Uh, the kids are in school. They don't want to leave. Their life's here. They're never going to get another job in investment banking again because of the way that the industry shrunk. What can they do? So they put together these, in well, we help them put together an interesting plan for their business um, and uh, because they've got the resources, they, they tell the immigration department all this good stuff that they're going to do, but they're never, help, they're never called to account for it because once they get to seven years, they make an application for the right of abode. And as we'll see, there's no inquiry at all as to what you've been doing during that application. It's just a matter of showing that you've been continuously an early resident for a period of not less than seven years for the purposes of the right of abode. So again, the immigration department know this and they're approving people on the strength of decent business plans with lots of cash in the bank and most of them are not actually planning to do any of this stuff really. Not that I counsel that obviously but, but that seems to be the order of the day with people with lots of money. Yeah? What's the lead time for investment banking? If you're here as a visitor adjusting to business investment four to six months. If you're here as a current resident about six weeks because it's different teams. There's a team on the 24th floor that deal with the, um, uh, that deal with the uh, uh, entry visas. Right. And then you've got the team on the 5th floor who are the resident section. And then they deal with, with that and they do it in a much, much quicker way. Entry visas always take longer. Okay, great. Any other questions? Okay, good. So, um, that notwithstanding, we've still got the Catch-22. So you may be here as an employee. Um, but you still have to make an application to the Immigration Department at the moment your intention to join in this business has become clear. So how can this uh, apply to the mainland of Norway? Do they get a game here, get a Dharma to ask for? No, and um, well, let, let, me put it, let me put it this way. Uh, the question that he's asking is, if you are a mainlander, presently resident on the mainland, and you want to make an application for a business investment visa under the general employment policy, given that you need to have 12 months residence outside of China or permanent residency in another country immediately prior to submitting your application, if you go and purchase Gambian residency or Vanuatu residency, will the immigration department accept the PR from those countries as being suitable PR for consideration under the general employment policy as I've just essayed? And I, I uh, have had two conversations. Well, I have one conversation. I've written to the Immigration Department once in this regard. And when I wrote to the Immigration Department, a senior officer wrote back to me and said, we don't distinguish between any countries when it comes to PR. Great. So then I called one of my contacts, if you will, in the Immigration Department. I have no influence in the Immigration Department, but you know, we operationally we deal with, people, with the officers all the time. So I said to her, I said, OK. If I, have an app, if I have an applicant who wants to make an application under the general employment policy and he's got PR uh, in Gambia, will that be accepted by your department? And she said, he's eligible to apply, but obviously didn't give any more information than that. But you have to take a step back and you've got to understand the immigration department of implementing policy from a floodgates perspective. And right now, the Immigration Department will accept Vanuatu and Gambia as being a suitable PR under the Capital Investment Entrance Scheme, which requires a $10 million investment in Hong Kong. 
So if you want to, you know, go off to Gambia and spend $100,000 or whatever it is to get PR and then, you know, make an application on the general employment policy and it's a cheap man's or a poor man's alternative to the capital investment entrance scheme, you can expect the immigration department to look at that for what it is. They'll apply the substantial contribution to the economy of Hong Kong test, but in my experience, I don't think you can use a general employment policy with PR from a country where you per where you've purchased it quickly for expediency in order to get into the general, general employment policy. I don't think that if your investment is any less than $10 million, they're going to say yes to it. And in fact, I've seen an application that wasn't done by me. I was asked to advise on, on reconsideration where there's a $4.5 million investment, and they said no to it. OK, so uh, we touched upon sponsorship a little bit earlier. But effectively, what it means is that um, it's a, sponsorship's all about um, providing a mechanism from the immigration department to, to, to obviate the requirement for the taxpayer to fund a foreign national's removal if the residence has gone wrong for any reason. Um, any bona fide Hong Kong resident uh, related to the party preferred, as I said earlier on, and uh, it's best to arrange this at the outset and be strategic if at all possible. If you've got somebody that can be a party to the application by way of sponsorship that also adds value in terms of your commercial relationship with them, that, uh, that can be factored into the mix and uh, will, be, uh, will obviously be, be looked at in the light of um, the fact that a local party is prepared to trade with you and, and they want to trade with you so much they're prepared to serve as your sponsor. So it's, it's, it makes, makes sense uh, to, my view, to my way of thinking. I spent a lot of time on this because it's such a, uh, uh, an important part of, of our immigration practice as well and increasingly I think you'll find it should be for yours too. But in summary, um, you need the investment visa when your intention to join in the business has crystallized. Um, if you don't have an application in the system, then you're vulnerable. The approvability test, substantial contribution to the economy of Hong Kong, is, in my view, the most single most difficult Hong Kong visa challenge. Uh, if you want to be uh, taken seriously by the immigration department, think and act big. And if you plan to be a one-man business, think twice about making an application. Uh, it does take a long time, particularly if you're here as a visitor. Uh, and it does tax your emotional and time resources because you've got everything at stake, right, in this application. And the fact that it's taking the department four to six months and you get these questions out of the blue, it can be quite disconcerting for an applicant. So just better set their expectations as to you know, what this experience will be like. And um, as I always say, uh, it's better to take uh, advice uh, if you can because otherwise you may fall into some trap or some hole that uh, exists because the immigration department encourage all comers to come and submit their applications. And uh, as I said earlier, if they like what uh, they see, you're in. If they don't like what they see, you're out. So if you don't know what you should be showing them, you could fall into a hole or two. <laughs>